Welcome back. This is Emily Seal. We are at Austin P. State University talking about theater. And uh, this chapter is Chapter 9, The Art of Design. So uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit when we talked about a day in the life of the theater and when we talked about Aristotle's elements. Um, this is spectacle. Uh, now Aristotle thought that spectacle was the least important, uh, but we in America really highly val value spectacle, all of the things that you see at the theater. It's one of the things we still have kind of up against movies. You know, you can't experience the wonder of big, beautiful costumes and a light show and a big, um, you know, set design. Those things are still part of the thrill of going to see a live theater. Um, and theater helps, uh, sorry, design helps tell the story. As you can see, those are pictures from Midsummer Night's Dream that I saw in the Globe. At the beginning of the story, you can see that they have their very prim and proper uh, Elizabethan costumes on. He's got his uh, little doublet and uh, boy shorts there, and she's very uh, tightly corseted. And then by the end of the play, you can see the picture on the right, they are in disarray, and this is sort of part of the story of Midsummer. Um, they start in the city, and then they move to the woods where they are chasing after each other and fighting over uh, respective lovers. And so not only do they emotionally kind of come apart, but the costume designer in that production did something very clever in that their clothes are literally coming apart at the seams and they're getting down in the dirt in the mire. So they would, you know, go off stage and exit and presumably splash mud all over themselves and come back on stage uh, as they wandered the woods. So design can help tell the story, the progress of the character. It can help elucidate the, um, the arc of the story itself. Uh, so that's Puck. And uh, if you know Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, he is the mischievous fairy who does a lot of the dealings. He puts the ointment on eyes and uh, gets the lovers mixed up in the first place. Um, but he is a sprightly character and those little feathers on his head that he wore really helped to paint the picture of a character that was sort of um, flitting about and uh, fairy-like without the obvious choice which is you know wings or uh, pointy ears uh, those little feathers can do a lot to help uh, kind of point to the character and we'll talk more about the psychology of clothing later on in the in the lecture um, also, but he's also bare-chested, and that says something about his character as well. He's natural, he is um, brave and, and fearless and uh, free, kind of a sense of freedom in that sprightly character of Puck. Um, design can help create an environment. Right? We're supposed to have this magical sense about midsummer. We're supposed to have a little bit of danger. We're in the woods. We don't know anything could happen. And uh, I really think that the costumes in this piece help to tell that story. They help to um, create a sense of magic or something different. Uh, you can see their headpieces there. The, the fur kind of makes it rough or different. Um, and uh, at the same time sort of barbaric which was really really helped tell the story and uh, in this is particularly important in places like the Globe Theater where it's natural lighting it's a minimalistic set design you can't do much you see they have a drape there to represent a wood but in the Globe uh, there's not a whole lot that you can do as far as big spectacular sets if you're on um, page 195 you can see that big beautiful set um, for Traveler in the Dark and that you know that obviously helps to create an environment as well but something as subtle as a few feathers and fur can also help create an environment suggestion of an environment so design is important design isn't just to look pretty it's a common misconception about the theater uh, you know a lot of beginning actors say I don't like the way I look in my character well 
uh, in my costume as my character and and many costume designers would then retort well we're not trying to make you look good we're trying to tell a story and if that story involves ram horns or feather mohawks then <laughs> then that's the story we need to tell we're not necessarily just painting a pretty picture although there is something to be said for um, pretty costumes and a, and a beautiful aesthetic something that is art. So many costumes um, that I've worn throughout my career, I, I really truly thought of them as art and something um, that should belong in a gallery somewhere. Um, really can be fun. So, um, you know, and then the designer helps create this story that can be so different from the other stories. The other play that I saw this summer of Midsummer Night's Dream was in Nashville. And you can see those fun, funky colors, kind of a punk rock aesthetic. They have tribal paint on them, but it's a much more um, lively and uh, kid-friendly show. If you've ever been to Nashville Shakespeare in the Park, you know there's lots of kids in the audience, and they try to keep the kids coming. Um, you can see that the uh, bottom, the donkey head there, that character, it's very cartoony and very fun. Once again, the, the atmosphere of Na Nashville Shakespeare in the Park was a lot less intimidating. I think if a child had seen the Globe Theater production, it was probably pretty scary. There were some haunting woodwinds, there were some um, really tribal fairies who were kind of um, very animalistic, uh, you know, not not necessarily kid friendly. Whereas Nashville Shakespeare was much more um, childlike and fun. There were times when they brought a giant uh, a ball on stage that they would, um, you know, send through the audience, and then they had these um, tubes that they could hit, and it would make different noises. Uh, lots of toys is what I'm saying, and so it was it was very much a a kid-friendly show, a fun, recycled show that had lots of uh, bright colors and playful, playful way about it. So, and it's still in Midsummer Night's Dream. That same story is still in Midsummer Night's Dream, but the director and the designers are just choosing to bring out different sides of it. You can see that this one is just as magical as the other one. Uh, that was done in London, uh, just as magical. It's just a different kind of perspective on what magic is. So before we get too heavy into talking about different kinds of design, we have to start with what kind of space we're dealing with in the first place. All of this is very heavily affected by the theater. So this is my auditorium, Powers Auditorium there. Um, you can see that it is, and we'll talk about this in just a second, a proscenium stage. It's only 300 seats, not very big. Um, and uh, the lip or the apron of my stage is pretty large, but we'll get to that in just a second. So those are kind of four, there are many, many types of stages, but those are four. Uh, the one in the top left-hand corner is the proscenium, and that is the most common style of, uh, of theater in the Western world. It has what's called a proscenium arch on it, which is a picture frame. Let me go back one here. You see that gray, the dark gray uh, box around it. That was what's called the proscenium arch or the picture frame. And that is the dominant style in opera houses in many Western theaters. We have that proscenium arch. It became popular at the turn of the century, of course, uh, and even before then, but a lot of the uh, theaters that were built that uh, still exist today are opera houses there, proscenium. Um, so then to the right of that we have a thrust stage and this is where the stage comes out to the audience. So um, this is the, the kind of theater that I predominantly performed in throughout my careers, my different universities and the different school uh, theaters that I've worked at. Uh, it's probably the most uh, second most common and also uh, more popular. If you build a theater day, most people are going to build a thrust because uh, you can be more intimate with the audience. You can come out to where they are. Uh, if you're thinking of the thrust in terms of uh, comparison, you might think of a runway right? A runway, the model walks down through the audience and then back out, not all the way through the audience, but just down to a certain place and then turns around and comes back. That is comparable to the thrust stage. 
I'm not going to really talk much about the traverse stage. It's just with an audience on either side. Uh, but we will talk about the arena stage. Um, you can think of this as like a basketball or a football arena. There's audience on all four sides of the stage. So, and then there's a found space. Theater can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to happen inside a uh, a theater building. Uh, you know, obviously there are street performers in Paris, Mimes most famously. If you go down to um, New Orleans or any big city center, you're going to see performers uh, asking for tips to do their their shtick on the side of the street. And um, you know, this is obviously a common thing that's happened since the beginning of time so you know theater is not limited to a building in and of itself so probably the most famous proscenium theater is the Moscow Art Theater where we talked about Konstantin Stanislavski you can see that their proscenium arch is a circle it's a half circle this is a traditional opera house and that it has those boxes on the side uh, and uh, there are many sort of perks to having a proscenium theater that make it to continue to be probably one of the most popular styles and that is the apron you can see the little lip of the stage that comes out over front that's called the apron um, the wings the fact that you can have actors enter from a place where the audience can't see them they're standing in the wings they're waiting in the wings right off stage and they have that curtains to mask where they're entering from so it helps keep up the illusion um, of the theater and it's convenient for the actors uh, another huge benefit to the proscenium theater is the fly system. Now this, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about day in the life of the theater, but those battens, those big uh, metal beams, uh, they can fly uh, drops which have painted uh, scenes on them. Uh, so the fly system is very convenient. You lower the levers. If you've ever seen maybe in a sitcom where someone cuts a sandbag and then something falls on stage that's a fly system um, because there's the fly system has a counterbalance so it used to be sandbags most theaters now it's just heavy uh, bricks or blocks that serve as a counterbalance so um, you can pull the curtain and then uh, you know the curtain closes but you can pull the same sort of lever and the bars will lower so we can adjust the lights or change out a bulb without climbing up high on a ladder and uh, so that's kind of one of the benefits of a proscenium theater that can only happen inside a proscenium where we have that hidden um, part of the stage uh, that's back away from the audience uh, so the thrust the thrust was the one that was used in ancient Greece you can see that the um, the actors can get close to the audience part of the audience would be looking at the back of their head uh, like I said like a runway it's thrust towards the audience um, this is a very intimate form of theater when it's not a thousand seat auditorium <laughs> like the Delphi theater uh, but it can be a more intimate way of presenting theater um, it feels more organic it feels like you don't have to cheat out to reach a certain audience member um, but you can see there's no fly space no place to hide uh, it's a much more transparent form of theater um, in the uh, ancient Grecian theater they used to have what were called vomitoriums and they still call it that even though it doesn't serve the same purpose that it used to um, so underneath where the audience sits there are tunnels that you can travel through so if I was um, if I was on the stage right hand of the theater I could walk all the way underneath there to the stage left in certain theaters and those are called vomitoriums or tunnels now the reason they called them a vomitorium you may know the ancient Grecian god that they were worshiping was the god of uh, wine and fertility and so people would often indulge and feast and then they would go and purge and throw up and so Presumably that's why they're called the vomitoriums because people used to go down and vomit or purge the food after the feast. Um, some other speculations is that maybe it's, it's uh, you know projecting forth from the stage. Uh, either way, very memorable there, <laughs> the vomitoriums. It's a different place in the theater, usually running underneath the stairs or tunnels through the uh, where the audience sits. 
So theater in the round became very popular in the 1960s and the 1970s when we were aiming for a more transparent theater, a more organic theater uh, where uh, you can see it from all sides. So it's just like you were hanging out at a party and you overhear a conversation. Um, theater in the round is uh, personable, it is intimate, but it can be uh, a little bit for an actor it takes a little more work for the staging of it because you don't want someone to sit on one side and stare at your back all night so the staging of it has to have lots of different movement you have to uh, be quite active in making sure that everybody gets a good show uh, I do like I, I performed at the Southern Arena Theater uh, for a few summers and I did enjoy being surrounded by the audience it is a different feel but the other thing that kind of happens in the arena stage is that sometimes um, the audience gets distracted by each other as weird as that sounds when they're you know looking right across at the other person um, but for what it's worth this is the arena you can think of it like a basketball arena where the audience is on every side um, so here's in our own Nashville Tennessee we have the Belmont University black box theater black box theaters are created to have um, a lot of versatility so you can see that those chairs you can pick them up and move them around if a if a director wanted to move this stage to the left hand side and put all of the seats on the other side they could uh, they are often where the experimental theater goes on the less popular theater uh, you can think of it as kind of an off-broadway sort of thing um, the lighting in black box theaters is often very flexible and open to interpretation um, they can be uh, very useful sort of fun spaces to uh, try different things but like I said they're usually um, all painted black every wall is painted black and so they're kind of more uh, flexible to deal with but they're not where the big musical for example would go on it's a very intimate theater um, you know you can create black box theaters out of anywhere you know just take a room and paint it black and stick some chairs in there and you have a black box theater so um, it's uh, meant to be able to be transformed into anything so it's kind of an exciting kind of theater many repertory theaters that have big stages in one area will have a small theater uh, for example TPAC has the Andrew Jackson black box theater uh, where they can do uh, different kinds of plays that are a little more offbeat. I saw Cabaret there, um, you know, so they can be transformed pretty easily. So those are the kind of uh, theaters. Just make sure you can keep them straight for the test and uh, you'll be good. So um, we're going to kind of talk generically about designing. Um, designing just like everything else in theater is a process and just like everything else we've talked about it starts with script analysis it starts with reading and rereading the play what can I do to help tell this story what um, elucidation can I create that helps and what needs are represented in the script uh, you know a lot of uh, the first step of any designer is going to be to really take a good hard look at the script and then um, they may want to research either the culture or the history um, not all plays will choose to put their use the original setting for example Midsummer Night's Dream is set in um, I think it's ancient Greece uh, and most people don't you can see in this rendering he has pants on jeans so you know they didn't wear pants in ancient Greece so you may start with uh, you know getting out your history book and looking what people were wearing or what kind of architecture was in that age um, and then also what was that culture doing different from other places a lot of um, a lot of a job of a professional designer is to be familiar with different trends and uh, in, in our world history and so then like I said designers are usually you know the director will meet the, with them up to a year before the actual production goes on and even start meeting with them and discussing the concept way before the actors even come into the picture at design meetings the director will sort of um, a good director will hear from the designers and where what they're thinking and then create a clear vision 
You know, they may start with some brainstorming or some um, pictures that are really metaphors that are central, just working on that concept and getting everybody on the same page. Remember, the director's job is to kind of mediate between designers. If they see that the backdrop is going to be painted red and then the the costumer is also putting everybody in red, you know, that's not going to blend well, that people are going to disappear on that. So um, the designers have to communicate in order to create a finished product because um, in the end look, the costumes need to go with the set, which needs to go with the lighting designer. If the lighting designer uses a red splash uh, with their gels, the costumers are all in red, and then the backdrop is red, then the whole thing is just going to blur together. So the designers have to meet and talk about their choices and make sure that they blend well together. You'll also discover as we kind of go through these um, different design areas, it's not always so cu cut and dry. In some theaters, the property person is going to work on the furniture. In other theaters, the set designer is responsible for the furniture. Uh, in other theaters, they may need the costume designer to reupholster the furniture. And so it's really a team effort. And delineating who does what work is something that's negotiated between the different um, the different crews and designers. So then after they've come up with a clear concept, then they go away and they draw, 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 and create renderings that help tell the story. So this uh, picture right here is obviously a bottom from Midsummer Night's Dream, and this is a rendering of um, both the makeup and costume design. It looks like those paintings on his chest and, and back are, cost are makeup choices. Um, and remember, in some design, you know, the, the costumer is also responsible for the makeup. So they go away and they draw and they come back and compare notes and look and see what aesthetics are going with, what themes they can tie in. And then they start building. And uh, some theaters, the designers help with the build. And some, um, you know, the designer is hired out and it's just handed over to a crew based solely on the sketches. So you have to make sure that the uh, renderings have texture in them, that they have nuance and detail so that the crews can see that and then create that. Um, and then after the show opens, one sometimes uh, forgotten aspect of of the technical process is maintaining. Sometimes we have a new cast member step in and we have to make a whole new dress. Uh, you know, if you're doing lighting, you have to change those gels. Uh, if you're doing sound, you have to change the battery packs on the uh, body mics. You know, maintaining shows can be just as expensive or costly or time consuming sometimes is just opening the show. So those crews, the run crews and the prep crews have to be um, standing by for the whole thing. And then in rare circumstances, uh, designers will make new choices. Something like a uh, mousetrap that's been running for 50 years in the West End, uh, you know, they may choose to update some of their costumes in order to fit the current times. So a big goal of any theater technician is to make sure that they're managing their resources. I had a really great uh, technical director once who told me, I can give you two out of three of time, money, and quality. So if you ask for something tomorrow, right, then which one is that time? So if I cover up time there, then it's it can be good quality, but it's going to cost you a lot of money, right? I can give you two out of three. So let's take, for instance, a meal. If I were to sit down and uh, start chopping onion and start uh, grating carrots and uh, I slave over this soup all day it's gonna cost me some of my time but it might be good quality right because I have spent so much time on this soup if on the other hand I'm racing to work in the morning and I, I forgot to bring lunch I might drive through and get some soup from the local convenience store now they're called convenience stores because they save you time but it's probably going to be overpriced and it might not be the best quality. So in general, as you're shopping for anything, you can kind of think of time, money, and quality as something that um, attention there, right? Uh, it may, 
you may be able to do it fast but it may cost you more or you may be able to do it fast but it's not the best quality so time is money in the theater is the main thing that I'm telling you here and the reason that they start on these um, productions you know a year before they start is because they can save money in using their time and their effort um, a lot of theater is a handmade art. It's something, you know, you have to sit and bead every bead or, uh, you know, hot glue every leaf to make that tree effect. So it can be very time consuming, but you can save money by dedicating time. So a good theater practitioner starts to know how long things are going to take and sort of has to make these compromises within their design. Uh, how can I uh, make something that is quality? We all want something that's quality for the money and the time that we can allocate. Uh, you know, if you look at Alice in Wonderland on Broadway, they had huge resources, right? My budget will not allow me to hand make every costume. We just don't have that kind of um, time or money. Our show goes up in three months uh, from beginning, from casting to opening night. So, uh, you know, we can't hand make every costume as much as I would love to be able to uh, present that kind of work. It's just not feasible for our small college. So um, managing your resources is a big part of any designer's work. I have a friend who um, does Playhouse on the Square costuming and she's always under budget and she's been there for five years <laughs> and they keep her on because she stays within her budget. Learning to manage the money of the theater is a major part of any designer. So um, another question to ask yourself is how does the design need to perform on stage? How does it need to tell that story? This is Dame Judi Dench in the Old Vic performance of Midsummer Night's Dream. And it's always a question with the donkey head right? Are they going to be able to hear the audience? There's a moment in the script where they actually take him from being a donkey to a human on stage, right? Many, I say that, the script is written to incline that way and not every performance does it that way, but many do. So you have to actually transform that person from a human, a donkey back into a human on stage. So, you know, is that is that donkey head going to have a chin strap? Are they going to be able to seamlessly and quickly change that costume? Um, how expressive is the actor going to be able to be within that costume? Pretty, pretty difficult stuff. So it comes into the pragmatic use of how is this going to actually help tell the story? You know, um, if you're a fairy with, uh, horns on your head and you're meant to represent a steed are you going to be able to enter through the doorway that's built in the globe theater or is your horn going to knock the side of the doorway every time you walk through so these are some practical things to think about how does the design of these uh, actually play out in the working of it one thing that we have for Alice in Wonderland is their day performances we bust the kids in from the area so the show starts at nine o'clock in the morning so the actors have to ask themselves, can I do this makeup at 8 o'clock in the morning? Can I do everything on this makeup in an hour? And they start talking about maybe using prosthetics, uh, you know, adding a nose or uh, handcrafting ears every morning. I start to ask them, are you going to be able to do this? Are you going to be able to get up and get to the theater in time? It quickly dwindled down their makeup designs, let me tell you, when it equated to hours of sleep. <laughs> Okay, so there's different kinds. We're on page 202 if you're following along in your book. So one thing that will be discussed among the designers is what style, what artistic style. Some of you may have taken art appreciation or art in high school, and you may have studied these different styles um, that happen, you know, is it cubist? Is it abstract? Is it realistic? And we'll talk more about this when we talk about genre. But particularly as artist styles, um, how are we going to represent? Because they need to be congruent. If the set has, um, you know, completely realistic and the costumes are abstract, then there's not, you know, continuity. Uh, by far the most common way to represent a play is just realistically, right? The light on that desk actually turns on, uh, you know, you feel like you're at home, there's light pouring in through the windows, uh, the door actually opens, it's a realistic set. For all intents and purposes, it looks like somebody's living room, right? It looks like somebody's home. Uh, 
historical realism is probably you know what we do most representing a certain time or place that is not the present and then they kind of hint at simplified or suggested realism where it's not as detailed as a regular house would be uh, but it still kind of evokes a general sense of realism expressionism is a style that's told through one person's perspective uh, this became very popular in the theater <coughs> with German Expressionism and uh, Bertolt Brecht and um, it often feels pretty nightmarish uh, it's um, it uh, has distorted perspective in many cases um, it can feel um, kind of haunting maybe um, so if, if an audience decides that I mean a, if a design team decides that they want to have a cr expressionistic sort of setting then it doesn't have to be uh, necessarily exactly as you really would have the apartment it might have things might be oversized or feel distorted because it's from the perspective of the person seeing it I would argue that um, Alice in Wonderland could be told with an expressionistic lens now of course with um, a children's show we're not going to go that far into the nightmare because we don't want to scare the children but the distortion of things is an important aspect of expressionism and then you probably heard of Salvador Dali and surrealism right uh, surrealism is emphasizes the subconscious so instead of um, what is actual is what's lurking in the mind of the person um, and so that can be a really fun artistic style um, you know one thing that heavily influenced my set designer was cubism you can see the cards in the background of the set next time I show you a picture of the set you can see the lines in the harsh sort of sense so um, many of these designers have studied art and have studied art movements and that's a kind of quick way for them to communicate to each other is to establish a style that is already predominant in the art world so moving on we are looking at set design um, now set design uh, has been happening since the golden age of Greece right there were usually a few doors on stage and some painted backgrounds and masks uh, then we get into the Renaissance uh, we had a lot of drops with forced perspective you can see that this one looks like um, the ocean is in the background uh, I think this one is actually from the royal time after the restoration of the throne of England they had these big spectacles with moving waves and uh, you may have seen representations of, of that sort of um, big spectacle in different movies that you've watched uh, where they create moving parts and in these historical plays it's pretty fun it's interesting too how many theaters worked without scenery the Chinese opera never had the Chinese opera didn't have uh, any kind of set design because they went to different banquet halls to perform for different royalty and so they had these conventions if a Chinese actor in the Peking Opera picked up a oar and started rowing then you knew that they were in the water um, if they picked up a sword you knew they were on the battlefield so it's different how different um, cultures handled these um, choices uh, but many uh, set designers are skilled in architecture and um, there's many different kinds of sets that you can create uh, for our set we have what's called a unit set it's that same staircase with the hole there that stays there the entire time and is meant to represent many locations the children's play director before me she really enjoyed uh, those painted backdrops and she would fly those in we have a fly system this is presumably one of those painted backdrops to represent different locations she would fly in the different um, painted backdrop so when they were in Wizard of Oz they had the haunted forest would come down and then and they would be in the Wicked Witch of the West's um, basement she would have that fly in so to represent different locations um, so the same set designer you know he has multiple skills he can do with woodworking and he can also uh, paint those big backdrops there's lots of different 
ways to represent scenery. So one thing that's very important for the director and the scenic designer to work out early on is the floor plan. Where does the furniture go and what are the levels of the theater? Um, this is really important as the a director starts to work out the staging of the play where people are going to stand and sit and this is almost always a negotiation between the director and the set designer um, because uh, you know a certain aesthetic may take up so much space and a director always wants every inch of the stage that they can use in order to have lots of variety and fun. You can tell that this is the bird's eye view. This is from the top and this is um, a version of Miss Julie by August Strindberg from the turn of the century Sweden. Um, so then the directors uh, this set designers next step is to create what's called a white model. It's often um, called a white model because it's not necessarily painted. It's often a foam core or poster board and they do it to create uh, the final look for the director so that they can kind of see what it's going to look like in a three dimension. Both this and the floor plan are on a one quarter inch scale and so um, it's two scaled so those uh, those columns there are as big as they're going to be uh, compared to the floor plan and it's very a lot of math a lot of detailed work just like architecture and then he talks about CAD AutoCAD I've never actually been able to work in a theater that could afford that kind of technology but the computer modeling so that you have a, a digital reality that the director can work walk through. That's kind of fun too. Um, and then of course there's the finished set and of August Strindberg's Miss Julie. Very very beautiful. You can tell it's sort of a haunting play just from looking at the set design. I really admire that. So let's move on to lighting design. Uh, obviously in the beginnings there wasn't a need for a lighting designer. In ancient Greece we had outdoor theaters and they would time when the play started based on where the sun was going to be. So that was uh, pretty fun. Uh, you know and rain or shine a lot of performances presumably went on in the rain. But then uh, during the Jacobean theater in, in Europe in England uh, they started moving it indoors with lots of candles lots and lots of candles we know that it was uh, very treacherous to be in a theater with all of those uh, lights and they would have reflectors and mirrors that they would try to use to create more light but it is um, always to very little avail and not much use um, and almost always everyone in the audience was lit as well before we started with light bulbs. Um, everyone in the audience could see each other which was presumably distracting. Um, but you may have heard of someone talking about the limelight. You know people fighting over the limelight to be in the limelight. Uh, this comes from when theaters started using gas and that's uh, lime right there that they would use um, to spark uh, limestone maybe familiar with that and they would spark it and use it uh, as part of the the gas uh, way of doing things so uh, when those like we talked about with directing when those gas lights came into the equation it really opened up what theaters could do with their lighting equipment um, and then obviously we moved over to electric bulbs and footlights and now we're on to dimmers and overhead lighting which is really fun. Um, dimmers uh, allow us to turn the lights up and down slowly and those different tracks we have so many instruments any theater you walk into uh, the most expensive thing in the room are those lighting instruments uh, you know in our theater we have about a hundred lighting instruments and each one of them is plugged into that board and so just like you switch on a lamp you can uh, dim the lights up and down. Luckily we have computers that you program those lighting looks into so you don't have to individually turn on every single lamp for every single look. Um, most any area on stage is usually going to have four lamps pointed at it. Uh, one from each 45 degree angle. 
up high um, so that we don't get really harsh shadows. That may be something that you've been distracted by in a theater before if the lighting was not good. Some of the harsh lines and shadows you see that aren't intentional. Um, but uh, the light board operator in many common uh, modern plays they just sit and press a button for every cue every time that the lights change because the computer has saved the program of the lights and so it's a lot easier job than it used to be. <laughs> um, so lighting has many jobs. It can evoke a mood. Obviously um, I saw this absolutely horrifying play in London this summer and uh, really effective use of spooky lighting. Uh, that up lighting where you see the shadows of what you usually see. Most of us when we look at each other the light source is on the ceiling and so we're used to seeing shadows underneath the nose, underneath the chin, uh, but when you put light under people and the ca shadows are cast in a different direction it can be really psychologically off-putting and it evoke a pretty spooky mood. Um, obviously candlelight uh, can create a romantic mood or a um, sense of magic or wonder as we see here in the glass menagerie. Um, and question for any lighting designer is is there a certain place that the light source is coming from? Right? Uh, in this situation the identical light source is the moon. So we can see the moon coming through the window and hitting her on the face. For most of Alice in Wonderland, we don't have identifiable light sources, right? We don't know if uh, most of us would just assume it was kind of a sunshine. So it comes from the ceiling, the lamps, and that would be a non-motivated. You can't actually tell where the light source comes from. If a person walks into a dark room and turns on a lamp, that's motivated light because we can see where the light source is. Right, but non-motivated light is just sort of a generic, generic wash from above. So um, lighting designers and implementers have a pretty complicated job that involves a lot of math. They have to figure out if the theater has enough wattage to support every instrument. They have to line up the instrument there. We can see it in a proscenium theater on the battens and hang it in a way that they can uh, angle the lighting instrument to face the actors on stage and um, each instrument then needs to have what's called a gel over it right see that frame so this is a this is a parkan probably the most popular kind of lighting instrument that's hung in the ceiling of a theater uh, and there's a frame on the on the end of that and we put a gel in that you can see that pink part there and that helps to create a color on the lighting because a really just a plain white light bulb can be kind of harsh and wash people out make them look like ghosts so in most theaters we have ambers and blues we have like a tan color and then a light blue color that together sort of represent the sun and the sky and create a naturalistic lighting it's not as harsh it doesn't look as painful the word that I have here uh, besides gels is gobo. A gobo is a cut piece of metal that creates a pattern. So you can see those stars on the ceiling there. There's a little piece of tin that has uh, stars cut out of it that we put on the frame of that instrument that then projects those stars onto the size. Lots of uh, commercial businesses are now using gobos with their logo on them. Um, in, in Nashville I've noticed particularly people splashing their um, their logos on the floors of convention halls to get people's attention. So it's just like a shadow puppet game. Uh, very cool. Gobos are often used to create the illusion of being in a forest or um, in a realistic place. Or I was in, you know, our town, they had a stained glass gobo where they were able to make it look like the floor had a stained glass um, projection on it as it would if there were sun shining through a stained glass onto the floor in a church. So it can be really fun to play with shadow and, uh, and light source. All right, so moving on at a breakneck speed, we're going to sound design. Um, not every theater has sound design. Uh, not every uh, play really demands a lot of music or sound design. Uh, 
Obviously back in ancient Greece they didn't use a whole lot. One important sound was thunder and uh, they or wind and rain, uh, often a sense of foreboding or pain impending. The Romans used to create these tunnels with metal and they would roll a boulder down it and create this really harsh thunder sound. So we have some record of that. Shakespeare loved his sound effects. Uh, he would actually shoot off cannons uh, during Henry I think it was the fifth one of the uh, the theater actually burned down because they had the cannon too close to the thatch roof. <laughs> um, but this is a thunder sheet here that was used. Uh, you would hang it from the fly system and then shake it and that big sheet of iron would sound like thunder. Uh, these lackeys also worked for the radio. They would create uh, sound effects with wood blocks or stamping leaves. Um, but remember it has to be loud enough in a theater to to echo throughout the entire space. Um, in uh, Japanese no and kabuki theater, the stage floors are actually uh, created a certain way so that the footsteps are more prominent. So uh, noise is always a big part of storytelling. It's something that we do subconsciously even when we're telling stories to each other. We include sometimes those, those sound effects for effect. Um, there are lots of kinds of uh, sound that are required during a play. Sometimes it's a musical underscore to set the tone of the story to help uh, transition into a different mood for the story, right? Obviously, I have a picture here of trumpeters. Fanfare has been a big part of royalty, especially in England. Uh, the announcing of these people with trumpets helps establish their regal authority. Um, music also helps transition the moods between scenes. So for example, um, when the caterpillar is introduced, I have some sitar music playing um, to help create a foreign or um, different kind of mood for Alice. Uh, that's one of kind of the weaknesses of the script is that we jump around so much. So I really am relying on that musical segues to help the audience transition from one character or location to the next or give the illusion of passing time. Those traditional segues between scenes, the music can be filler while the uh, furniture is rearranged or the lights are coming down or an actor is exiting or entering. It's kind of a convention that we've created in the theater to help smooth the transitions and keep the audience entertained because if you leave them alone sometimes they can we can lose them. They can tune out. So music helps um, helps them stay in the story. <clears throat> sometimes it helps create uh, the place. So we may not to be able to afford uh, to build a skyscraper on stage, but if you hear that jackhammering when we open the scene, it may give the illusion that they're in a metropolitan area, right? The same thing could be true of the outdoors. We can't necessarily plant sod on the stage and, uh, you know, grow grass. <laughs> it's near impossible. Um, but if we have some little birds twerping, then you may say, oh, they're outside. They're enjoying the great outdoors. So environmental noise can really help the scenic designer. Amplification. This is the number one role of music is to help people be heard. Uh, the reason I have this cheesy little ha Hannah Montana mic here is because I've noticed that lately in the theater, when I was um, acting more, they would go to great lengths to hide a microphone. Often it was in the part of your wig. It was a little tan colored uh, microphone that they would hide along your face or in the part of your wig. But I'm noticing more and more this sort of rock star aesthetic and us just accepting uh, that the microphone is there. So next time you see a musical, ask yourself, where is the mic hidden? Are they trying to hide the mics or they had them in plain sight to sort of um, celebrate the rock star aesthetic. Something interesting to think about. Not all theaters use amplification, body mics. Um, some theaters have good acoustics and they just ask their actors to talk loud. But in many cases, creating good levels and harmony among the sounds of your actors, it's important to mic them. Um, so. Moving on to my favorite aspect of technical theater, and that is costume design. So um, costume design is uh, psychological, 
right? You're helping to tell the story of that character. For example, we have the two different Alices, right? Um, in Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, she has a lot more detail on her costume. It's very long. She looks older, right? We know that in the Tim Burton version, she's quite a bit older. Whereas this um, Alice from the Disney version, she's got the short skirt with the white tights. She feels like her little Mary Janes, like she is a youngster. Uh, she's got the lace on her collar. She still feels Victorian. She still feels period, but um, she feels a lot younger, right? Most grown adults don't walk around wearing aprons. So um, you can tell the differences in these characters just by what they're wearing and uh, how they choose to present themselves. So obviously costumes are psychological and we want the audience to have a certain reaction to certain characters and so we use color as one of the most uh, predominant ways that we decide to do that. But it's interesting to remember that color is different from country to country. So I know I keep using Chinese opera as an example, but it's just a very um, predominant and established kind of theater on the other side of the world. So uh, in the Peking opera, red is the color of the good guy, of someone trustworthy. Whereas in America, many of us associate red with the devil or sex or danger. So remember that different colors can mean different things in different cultures. Um, Obviously, uh, if we see a woman in a white dress, many of us are going to think bride, just because of the context of where we live. So it's important to remember um, what your audience may associate with any given costume or color. Um, you know, what is the psychology of your audience and how can you tap into that? with an unspoken language of costumes. And many of us, you know, we may not think about the fact that what we choose to put on in the morning is has a tactic to it. Do we want respect? Well, maybe we put on a tie. Do we want um, to be sexualized? Then maybe we wear provocative clothing, right? A character has those same tactics in mind. So a costumer has to kind of psychoanalyze every person in a show to decide um, what kind of message they want to send the audience. And just like any other art form, um, there are the traditional design elements, line, right? What is the line of these bell dresses? Goes from their waist out to a big poofy bottom. It's a big trick of a lot of costume designers is just to create the line of the period. Uh, you know, if I was doing a 1970s show, maybe hair, and they're all wearing bell bottoms. I might take regular jeans and insert um, bells in the bottom of them by cutting the jeans and putting fabric inserts to create the same line. So instead of having to go find vintage 1970 or 1960s pants, I just change the line. If I'm doing a show in the 1940s and we have lots of pencil skirts, I would just go to the store and buy modern day pencil skirts because as long as it's kind of the same line from a distance the same silhouette as what the people wore people will accept the costume texture right um, I said earlier Puck has those little feathers on his head and they're sprightly and they're young uh, different textures have been associated with different periods in history um, obviously these big Cinderella this is um, Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella on Broadway right now. All of that fabric and poofiness and texture says a lot about the women and the way that they flounce around stage. Uh, it's important for costumers to know their fabrics. How is this fabric going to hold up over time? What does this fabric say about the person? In Elizabethan times, in Shakespeare's time, it was actually illegal for people of a certain class to represent uh, a fabric or a color out of their class system. So if they were peasants, they couldn't wear velvet or silk. So that's something important to remember when you're costuming a show. Can they afford these fabrics? And in the theater, texture is very important. It helps to uh, bring the audience in. Obviously, sequins and beading has always been a big part of um, creating a big splashy spectacle for the theater. Um, but texture can be faked, right? We can use satin rather than real silk. We can use plush velvet rather than crush velvet. So kind of creating the illusion of wealth with our fake diamonds <laughs> is a big trick of the theater. And then also harmony, 
right? How do these dresses go together? They all look like they're from the same play. And it's important if you're telling a story from a world to create some continuity within those worlds. Also to think about the color. Are these two similar? Are they wearing the same color? In um, Shakespeare plays, often uh, the two families, if we have um, the Montagues and the Capulets, they'll football player it. <laughs> the costume designer will put all of the Capulets in red and all of the Montagues in blue, and they do that to help association. It's not realistic. That's not how actually um, people probably dressed with the same colors as their cousin. I don't know, unless maybe it's a shield thing. Um, their family tartan if they're Scottish, but in many cases that just helps delineate and remind the audience these people are associated together and those people are associated together. So color, harmony, line, texture, these are just a glance at how complicated creating a good aesthetic for your show can be. Um, so there's lots of uh, routes in obtaining costumes. Um, uh, obviously, as you can see from these renderings here, uh, the most common way for a theater, of, especially a theater with money, is to build them, to pull in a costume designer who creates a one-of-a-kind couture dress and then have an army of stitchers make that a reality. It's really a beautiful and fun process to watch and be a part of, um, to see something go from page to stage, as we said earlier. Many theaters already have a collection of costumes in their repertoire that they can kind of pull out and make adjustments to, um, either fitting it to the actor's body or dyeing it a different color. Many of us have entire costume stocks from past performances that we can draw on and work with. Um, renting. This is what I'm doing a lot for Alice in Wonderland. We just went to performance studios in Nashville and borrowed costumes. You can borrow them um, through the mail, which is kind of a little bit uh, nerve-wracking for me, <laughs> having someone in New York send me my costumes and just making sure they get through the mail okay. I have done it. It is uh, worthwhile. It's also interesting to note that there's a new trend of designers uh, creating their own costumes and renting them from their home. Uh, it's kind of an interesting trend, uh, but uh, renting a costume, obviously you keep it for a couple weeks and then you send it back. Uh, that's uh, one way to do the costumes. If you want to go look at uh, costumes online, uh, broadwayworld.com, there's lots of really fun costume rental sites. And, uh, you know, if you want something for Halloween, check it out. And then obviously some costumes, if we're doing like a modern play, uh, you can just go and buy them off the rack. You can just go to your local department store and pick out a suit that goes well with the kind of production you're doing. So those are just some of the ways that you obtain costumes. If you're doing a production, it's always important to remember who you borrowed or bought or rented things from um, because the strike process of putting all those costumes back where they go uh, can be complicated if you haven't kept good records. All right, moving on to properties. Remember I said the word prop came from um, the old stamp that they used to put on theater, property of the theater from the different items that were props on stage. Most props that we talk about are something that you hand on stage. So a letter, a pencil, a coffee mug, anything that the actor takes in their hand on stage is called a hand prop. Prop tables are often set up backstage with labeled areas of where certain props go. Uh, you know, if a scene has a pencil in it, it can absolutely stop a show in its tracks if the actor forgets to bring out that pencil, even though it may be the tiniest of little details. Uh, if there's dialogue around it, it's a blaring error in the play if it's not there. Set props uh, are furniture or draperies, uh, things that go on the sets, uh, sofas, beds, chairs. I had a friend who uh, she did some set design for me and she had a degree from Harvard Arts and she spent most of her time learning about different trends in furniture and uh, how to identify and recreate those furniture pieces. She specialized in set props. So in some cases, in some theaters, the set designer has to also create the set props and the furniture on stage. Many theaters. Um, and then there's also set dressing or set decor. Uh, you know, the shelves, the uh, 
the draperies, the um, set decoration to make it really feel like a home. Um, this is one of the more challenging props that any theater has. You may recognize it from Little Shop of Horrors. Right? We have the plant that grows inside and that puppeteer there uh, has to work those plants. So some of these uh, bigger props are something that you can rent as well rather than fabricating or making. Many props are prop designers or jack-of-all-trades. They're artists who have the ability to sew. They know their glues. They know what fabrication works and what doesn't. Um, prop making can be a tedious process and uh, has to be someone who um, has a wide knowledge of, about lots of materials and, and how to create them. So those are props. Makeup is the last kind of design we're going to talk about today. Uh, I just love the Alice in Wonderland Mad Hatter makeup in the corner there. It's so imaginative. It almost looks like something that a kid would design. Uh, so fun. You can see he has contacts there to change the color of his eyes. He has wigs on his uh, eyebrows. He has just some non-conventional colors that you wouldn't think about using. It's really um, fascinating. Uh, if you've ever seen How the Grinch Stole Christmas, um, I, they have a behind the scenes kind of section on it that I watched just talking about how Jim Carrey took three hours to get into makeup every single day. Um, you know, they would individually uh, thread those hairs onto his face. It's a really tedious process. And those foam appliques had to be placed and painted and airbrushed every single day. Um, and he said by the end of it, he was just so zen. He had his meditation down pat, just waiting for the makeup to get f finished. Um, there's a show on the Sci-Fi Network uh, that I really enjoy called Face Off, where they do different sci-fi um, makeup jobs every week and it's a reality show. It's really really fun just to watch what people can do with a little foam and a little paint to change it the way that a person looks. So there's two basic kinds of makeup. There's straight makeup which is just beauty makeup, you know, putting on a mascara, lipstick, that kind of thing. And then there's character makeup, creating a creature or a, a different character. Um, obviously both <coughs> the Grinch and uh, and the Mad Hatter would be considered character makeup, something different. Um, common use of makeup was to enhance visibility. So if you've ever seen Charlie Chaplin and the way that he had over-exaggerated eye makeup, that wasn't just for fashion's sake. It was so that the bad film quality could capture his expressions on stage. He had to darken in his eyebrows so that people could see when he looked surprised. So if you look at the um, Victorian times and pictures of actors then, uh, they look uh, over exaggerated. They had their eyebrows dark and their eye makeup. That's because the lighting equipment wasn't good. When I worked in outdoor theater and, um, you know, 4,000 seat arenas, you had to kind of accentuate and highlight your cheekbones, put on way too much eye makeup, um, never go out without lipstick on because. Uh, your face just disappears from that length if you're not careful about highlighting and nuance people being able to see you from the back of the theater. Another common reason for makeup in the theater is aging an actor, right? Um, many people in the theater, it's it's pretty rare for people to stay into the theater up until their old age. Uh, there's many reasons for that. Memorizing lines when you get older is really difficult. Um, a lot of theater goes on in educational settings, so obviously we don't have a lot of non-traditional or older students who can be cast in those parts, so we just draw wrinkles on a, a younger student. There's many ways to do this. Um, you can just create highlights and shadows on the face. Uh, you can use tissue and um, uh, create wrinkle look from there. Uh, there's lots of ways to age an actor, but that's one of the one of the most common types of makeup that we do in the theater. I actually, when I was doing makeup design for a play, talked a guy into shaving his head into male pattern baldness. <laughs> very proud of that. He shaved just the top of his head and I talked him into it uh, <laughs> so that I didn't have to put him in a bald cap every night because those things are a pain in the butt. But, um, you know, creating an, a, an illusion of age is one of the many reasons that we create makeup. Um, 
As I said, you know, foam or latex pieces are often spirit gum to, to the face to create a completely different identity. One of the most famous of these prosthetics is Cyrano de Bergiac, who's known for his really long nose. Uh, when we did the w Wizard of Oz, obviously the witch nose is pretty as iconic. So we just create those foam pieces and then attach them to the face. So. Latex is smelly, smelly stuff, but it, it is it does work wonders in creating false noses or warts or scars. It can be a really fun game to play with makeup. So in conclusion, um, spectacle is not necessary, right? Uh, it isn't a requirement. Someone can stand up on stage and just tell a story, and that is theater. But spectacle really pushes art and and helps tell the story. It helps create an environment where people are easily uh, going to be able to suspend their disbelief. They're going to be able to appreciate the story and go there with the actors if they have all of this help from these entire uh, crews of people. There are usually twice as many people backstage as there are on stage. They're the unsung heroes of the theater. So. Um, if you haven't already, when you go to the theater, take the time to really look at those names and appreciate their artistry. Uh, in the Broadway, in the American Broadway, it's half of what we do is, is all of the spectacle, the lights, the sound, the costumes. It's uh, very, very important in the traditional American style to have a big spectacle for your audience to enjoy. So. I hope you've been able to slightly stick your toe in all of this big language about technical theater and had a greater appreciation for it as a result. Thank you for listening.